Okay, good evening. It's uh, five o'clock uh, five o'clock your time, eight o'clock my time. Uh, so we've got a nice hour together. I really appreciate the invitation to speak about pediatric urodynamics. Uh, I'm from Boston Children's Hospital. I'm one of the 10 faculty members here and uh, I co-direct the uh, urodynamics facility. Uh, and so this is something that's near and dear to my heart. I have no disclosures. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge Dr. Stuart Bauer. He is one of our most senior members. He's still practicing, uh, mostly your dynamics. And really he's taught uh, now several generations of, of uh, pediatric urologists and urologists, all they know about your dynamics. And he's really a giant in the field, uh, one of the grandfathers of pediatric your dynamics. So we're, I'm indebted uh, to Stu and, and, um, and uh, I hope you all get a chance to meet him someday. He's, he's a, uh, amazing person. So I'll cover quickly uh, background uh, and then go into the different kinds of your dynamic studies, uh, touch on your dynamics specifically in the spina bifida population, and then offer some key takeaways. Uh, the definition of, of, of your dynamics is a physiologic study of the lower urinary tract uh, during its two phases of the micturition cycle in an attempt to recreate the normal pattern of urinary storage and evacuation. It involves both invasive and non-invasive testing to assess these functions. It tries to accomplish these, this objective uh, in the least intrusive invasive way that we can in order to obtain meaningful and reproducible results. The indications for your dynamic studies broadly include anatomic problems such as posterior urethral valves, vesicle urethral reflux in some cases, bladder extrophy and epispadius. The most common would be the neurological problems, such as spina bifida or myelodysplasia, tethered cord syndromes, sacral agenesis, and a whole spectrum of spastic diplegia, uh, such as cerebral palsy, uh, et cetera. And then functional problems, including day and nighttime incontinence and recurrent urinary tract infections. And please uh, recognize that I'm not talking about invasive urodynamic studies for all of these cohorts, just urodynamic studies in general. So we have quite the armamentarium when we're talking about the spectrum of urodynamic studies. It starts with uroflometry, then uroflometry with simultaneous patch EMG or electromyography, systemetrogram, voiding pressure studies, uh, systemetrogram, voiding pressure studies, and sphincter EMG. Systemetrogram, voiding pressure studies coupled with the radionuclide cystogram to test for simultaneous uh, vesicle rebral reflux. And finally, systemetrogram combined with pressure flow studies or avoiding pressure studies and fluoroscopy, otherwise known as video urodynamics. A key to performing meaningful urodynamic studies, making it worth your while uh, and your patient's while, is asking the right questions. What information have you gained so far from ancillary testing, such as the history and physical, all important, obviously, imaging studies? What information do you want to obtain from your investigations? What study would efficiently answer the questions posed? And could information be gained from non-invasive studies versus invasive studies? And performing meaningful, uh, meaningful studies really starts with education and preparation. You need to obtain parental acceptance with a careful uh, description of what is going to happen, uh, understanding for those patients uh, old enough to understand, uh, and certainly the ones too young to fully understand, putting it in terms that they can understand at least some of it. Uh, familiarization with the components of the study and providing pre-testing materials such as handouts, facility websites, so on and so forth. And then a strict adherence to a protocol that that produces meaningful your dynamic study results, such as a rectal clean, a rectal clean out one to two days before uh, the procedure and then managing the lower urinary tract modulating medications, such as knowing what medications a patient is taking, the dosage and the frequency, uh, to be sure you know when a patient took such medications, and then to discontinue them uh, if you need to know the function, i.e. if you're asking the question, is the medication working or not, you may discontinue or keep the medication going. So you have to be really thoughtful about all of those parameters. But your dynamic studies are not easy for kids. And that really is why it's so important to prepare carefully and to be consistent. 
Um, this is a study we recently published just a couple months ago. And we worked on this, thankfully, uh, before COVID. And we observed 76 urodynamic studies. And we noticed the highest distress during urethral catheterization, and in our case, placement of a needle uh, EMG. And I'll get into that a little bit later, uh, what that's all about. 44% um, of our families felt unprepared uh, or patients felt unprepared of what was going to happen. And this is despite extremely careful and explicit preparation. So when someone is preparing for a, a procedure such as this, especially a young child, they are really frightful, they're really scared, and they're hearing a fraction of what you're saying. So this really highlights that. 50% exhibited at least one interfering behavior. And um, the, if this was the initial urodynamic study, it was associated with greater pain uh, uh, scores and distress. So we know it's a tough test. Uh, everybody knows that, but this is, I, to our knowledge, the first study that really tried to quantify that. So how about coping? How do we get kids through this? Well, we're actually doing a study we were uh, before uh, COVID uh, hit, and uh, we're about halfway through. This is a randomized trial looking at uh, the use of virtual reality uh, and um, to distract kids and get them through it. We're currently using just generic programming, um, and but eventually we hope to have really individualized programs such as, you know, a child can visualize um, what is happening in certain parts of uh, the study in a way that, um, that makes it um, less frightening. So we're hoping to uh, recruit 40 patients in the VR arm and 40 in the traditional arm, which is basically using an LCD screen on a boom, which we've used forever and ever. They get to select whatever little movie they wanna watch. And we have a full-time uh, child life specialist to help them through. That's the traditional way of trying to get patients to cope with your dynamic studies. But it does take a village, it takes physicians, it takes nurses, and we are very lucky to have hired a child life specialist about a year and a half ago. A very different from adult year dynamics that can be done in a small office by perhaps one nurse or technician. Uh, here we really, it's all hands on deck, uh, including a parent uh, present to try to get kids uh, through this study. So um, we'll start with uroflometry, uh, the least invasive. Um, your dynamic test. And the definition is the real-time measurement of urinary flow curves that records velocity uh, in seconds and then the voided volume. The optimal conditions are that a child uh, arrives well hydrated but not over distended. That is easier said than done, I must say. Um, we do get a bladder scan before starting the flow to get a sense of how much is in there. And often if they come dehydrated, we'll send them out to the waiting area to drink and to become better hydrated so we can get a more valid study. So we do do that to be sure that it's worth uh, their time. Um, we, you locate the flow meter in a private setting where the child feels comfortable. We instruct boys to aim, and I'll show you this in a second, at a specific site uh, and, uh, and provide good foot support uh, for girls and an adequate size seat for girls so they're comfortable. This is the, the bullseye, so to speak. Uh, and the, the, the goal here is to eliminate artifacts. This is a directed aim flow where you see a, a fairly smooth curve. There's a little bit of uh, uh, interference here, but for the most part, a good um, a directed smooth curve. And this is a random aim where the child is just sort of voiding wherever, wherever he wants. And so this will be a non-valid study and again, a waste of their time. And so we really wanna give them a bullseye. Um, and so foot rest uh, for girls. Uh, in addition, a, a seat that has the appropriate opening. You can imagine a small child who is bracing for dear life so they don't fall in the toilet and they're not going to be able to relax and get a valid uroflometry. So good foot rest, an appropriate size seat, and that will set the child up for success. So um, what are the optimal parameters? The voided volume should be at least 50% of the expected capacity for age. And this is the uh, simple formula that we always teach, and that is age plus two times 30 will estimate uh, bl estimated bladder capacity in milliliters. The ideal volume uh, is roughly between 65 to 115% of the uh, expected capacity. The residual volume should be really low, less than 6% of the estimated uh, bladder volume uh, or bladder capacity, or less than just 10%, uh, rather 10 mLs. And that's a, a, a fair way to remember it. Um, if there are flow characteristics that just don't make sense, or you have a question about the aim, so on and so forth, we repeat them. And we actually do this quite, quite often. 
um, or we asked them to do a second flow and then and check uh, the residual volume afterwards. Um, you, we always do note when the last time the child voided uh, to assess urine production or how well hydrated are they. And normal urine production in children is roughly one to two mLs per kilogram uh, per hour. So um, urine volume definitely has an effect on flow rate parameters. When a child comes grossly over distended, uh, such as this child, 697 mL, they generally will have a slower flow rate and have a higher post void residual. It's sort of a, a, a short term myogenic failure of sorts. Whereas a child comes with a normal volume, 275 mLs or so, you get a bell shaped curve and a very low uh, post void residual. So um, the, uh, the flow pattern, uh, these are the different types. A bell shaped curve, of course, is the normal, smooth, rounded, perfect bell shaped curve. A tower a pattern is an explosive flow, generally uh, related to overactive bladder. A staccato pattern shows sharp peaks and troughs, but the flow is continuous. This generally indicates uh, an overactive external urethral sphincter. Uh, interrupted, you'll see discrete peaks with no flow in between the peaks. Uh, this generally reflects an underactive bladder that a patient has to strain to empty. And finally, a plateau curve that is a prolonged slow flow. And this generally, or at least you should think about, uh, obstruction happening. Uh, this is that nice uh, bell-shaped curve. Once again, you see this really textbook, just perfect. This is that tower flow where, where you have an overactive bladder, really an explosive flow when the detrusor contracts down. Then this is the, um, uh, the, the partner systemetrogram demonstrating the overactive uh, detrusor contractions that again are causing this uh, towering uh, flow. This is the staccato flow. And again, the, the overactive uh, sphincter, and you can see it's a continuous flow, but there are these superimposed peaks on top of the flow. And then this is the interrupted flow, the so-called underactive bladder. So these are the small voids back down to zero, small void back down to zero, and so on and so forth. And that is someone who's straining to void using mostly uh, Valsalva maneuver to do so. Uh, Izzy Franco, who's now uh, down at Yale, um, has published on this a flow index. You may see this in the literature. Uh, truth be told, we don't use this uh, clinically. We just use our Euroflowmetry data, but this is really useful for those that may not have ready access to a Euroflow, uh, Euroflow machine. And basically, this is a, 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 a formula that is predictive of the different types of flow patterns. So something uh, to keep an eye out. Um, and again, you can use it if, if you don't have a, a flow machine. So after a patient voids, of course, we get a bladder scanner. These are handheld devices. We'll say these are not cheap. You know, these little tiny handheld devices uh, cost us, you know, ten to fifteen thousand dollars. So this stuff is really not not trivial, even though it looks so simple. And so basically, it gives you just quantification of the exact uh, volume, and it's really accurate. This is what that little screen looks like. Uh, and um, again, we use this every single day. So what are the indications for uroflowmetry? For our patients that come with day and nighttime lower urinary tract symptoms that are unresponsive to time voiding and or taking too much time to empty, those that show up with recurrent non-febrile urinary tract infections, patients that you find may have a thick wall bladder and ultrasound or incomplete emptying on a post-void ultrasound that you're getting for something else, a history of straining or complaints of a prolonged flow, incontinence certainly, and the recurrent terminal uh, hematuria. And I'll get to that in a second. So uh, the ideal test for flow rate is to get a sense of bladder capacity and ability to empty in a non-threatening, comfortable manner. Non-invasive is the key. It does provide very strong clues to bladder function and potential causes of incontinence and urinary tract infection. Can direct clin a clinician to the appropriate next steps to confirm the type of abnormality. And it can reveal increased urine production as an etiology for lower urinary tract symptoms. To circle back to that notion of, of having a sense of, of how much the patient uh, comes in with a full bladder and when the last time was that they emptied. Um, this is just something to keep in mind. This is a nine-year-old boy who presented uh, to us with several weeks of dysuria and two episodes of terminal hematuria, but his terminal hematuria had been chronic off and on for about a year. And so this is just the bright red blood, few drops at the end of uh, the voiding phase, drops, drips down into the toilet uh, or on the toilet seat. I uh, can't really miss it as a very um, common uh, scenario. Um, we've got a flow rate and you see the slow, prolonged flow rate. 
and he emptied all the way to 250 ml. And basically, um, we repeated this three times and it was the same every single time. And then we got a retrograde urethrogram, which revealed this ball bar urethral stricture. So something to always keep in mind that this can really tip you off to an obstructive lesion um, that requires surgery. So that's certainly first and foremost on our minds is to rule out anything surgical uh, that can get the patient into trouble. So how about combining flow and patch EMG? We do this uh, fairly routinely, several per week, I would say. Um, and the EMG electrodes are placed on the perineum, typically just in the, in the anal verge, at the three and six o'clock position. Um, this assesses the activity of the urethral sphincter during voiding. It distinguishes dysfunctional voiding from straining to empty. This is quite useful. And it directs our treatment to biofeedback training versus just behavioral stuff like time voids and double voiding to empty well. If a patient demonstrates that they're a dysfunctional voider as defined by increasing, increasing your pelvic musculature or external urethral sphincter activity while voiding, well then they can be submitted to biofeedback or pelvic floor muscle therapy. So um, the, pace, the placement of the patches are here perianally, basically on the perineum. And, and these are very tiny uh, patch electrodes um, that do not hurt when they're removed. And this is important. This is a great example of why this is so useful. These are two four-year-old girls who presented to our clinic with lower urinary tract symptoms and recurrent uh, non-febrile urinary tract infections. This girl has urge incontinence or urge vo urgent voiding. And here you see she voids and the patch EMG on, the, on that perineum picks up increased activity. So she's firing as she's trying to void. This is by definition dysfunctional voiding. This is a child we submit if mature enough to um, biofeedback. This child, on the other hand, has some mild urge uh, and urge incontinence, um, and, but had a large volume void, 180% of their estimated bladder capacity. And here you see the staccato uh, pattern, maybe some interrupted as it co comes back down to baseline. And this patient completely relaxes her sphincter muscles. So this is not dysfunctional voiding. This is an underactive bladder. So um, again, what are the indications for this combination of flow and patch EMG? It is the staccato in, or interrupted flow pattern. Um, it's incomplete emptying on that initial flow rate. Um, if there is evidence of increased voiding pressure or incomplete emptying, or if you get a VCUG for recurrent febrile urinary tract infections, for example, if you're suspecting reflux of urine, and you see the spin top deformity, the patch EMG can be helpful uh, to really make that diagnosis as objectively as possible. So how about then going on to um, a more invasive test, the systemetrogram. A systemetrogram determines capacity, compliance, and the presence of bladder overactivity during the storage phase. And then the emptying phase is the integral part. Of course, this is uh, performed with both bladder and rectal catheters. Um, this measures the characteristics of the detrusor muscle. It distinguishes overactivity from, overactivity from artifacts of motion and helps determine uh, compliance, which we'll discuss in a second. The fill rate should be less than 10% of the expected capacity, fill rate per minute. So uh, the key here is slow, as slow as possible, especially in children. Um, a natural fill would be great if we can have patients hang around for you know a couple hours, but um, that is not um, uh, practical to do clinically. But of course, that would be the, the most valid um, uh, characterization of, of a patient's urinary tract. So this is the general equipment. They all look about the same. There aren't that many companies uh, in the world anymore. Uh, and essentially you have a tower that contains the pumps and that's hooked up to a computer that runs the urodynamic software that then records the different pressures. Um, urodynamic tables in general in adults are sort of um, allows you to perform urodynamics in a seated position. In kids, that's much trickier. Kids don't do as well sitting up just because of the fearful nature of the test and the fact they really don't hold still very well. So our table is actually just like this one. It has the ability to be to, to, to have a patient sit up, which we generally reserve for those kids that are sort of peri-adolescent or adolescent and older. The younger kids generally lie supine and get propped up by uh, some pillows or blankets if, if they can tolerate that. Um, this is just a cartoon that I found on the internet. Um, just to illustrate where the catheters go for those of you that are not familiar with your dynamics. And basically you get the, the pressure transducing catheter that gets placed in the bladder. This is obviously a, a female model. And 
that is a pressure transducing catheter. It does have a little balloon on the end, so it stays in place. Um, these catheters do have a pressure probe that picks up urethral pressure. We don't use this very often. It's very difficult to get accurate urethral uh, pressures. The catheter, especially in kids, just slides around and doesn't stay in place very well as, as the child is moving. Um, so we don't get that very often. But then this is the rectal probe that goes in the rectum, again, to measure intra-abdominal pressure. And the importance of that rectal probe cannot be overstated. That really has to be there. And here you see why. You see, if you just took the bladder pressure or the, the, um, the PVES, as it's called, uh, pressure of the vesicle, you'll see a high pressure here starts climbing up. And, but then as we see the, the, uh, the abdominal pressure through the rectal probe, it matches that pressure, subtract this from this to get your actual detrusor pressure. So uh, absolutely critical to get that intra-abdominal pressure. The bowel, the reason we do a little rectal, a rectal clean out typically with a suppository if the patient will tolerate, and if not, we typically do some Miralax at least a couple days before the test. Um, this is without a bowel clean out and unfortunately, or without a successful bowel clean out, I should say, because we, we try to get that in every patient. Um, you'll see that uh, you'll get this uh, rectal uh, contractions uh, happening, which then can confound your study. And sometimes you even get negative pressures, which will add to this and you'll get actually higher detrusor pressures than are, than are actually valid. And so this is the same patient that then had a nice clean out. We brought back for another study. And you can see the big difference in the abdominal pressure probe. This is nice and calm. And then you have a nice valid study that you can rely upon. So um, how about the effects of fill rate? I mentioned earlier that you should fill it as slowly as possible. And so what exactly does that mean? This is a study from a long time ago. This is David Joseph uh, from Alabama. Um, and he studied, this is 1992, who studied 38 patients and basically did three filling phases, one medium, so-called, one really slowly, and then a third one medium again. And basically he showed that patients have much higher pressures um, and occur, pressures as higher than 40 centimeters of water, for example, occur twice as often in the medium fill rate. And so these are patients that had uh, spina bifida neurogenic bladders. And change in pressures greater than 15 centimeters of water, suddenly these sort of spikes indicating the truser irritability happen only in the medium fill uh, patients, uh, medium fill um, uh, uh, runs as well. And the conclusion was that billing, uh, bladder filling rate affects the truser pressure measurements. And, and so that's well known and the slower the better. Generally, we start at five um, mLs uh, per minute and we try to do that uh, for as long as we can. Uh, and um, sometimes if a patient has a very large bladder, we will, we will raise it to 10 or 15, but generally stay as low as possible. So this is an example of a CMG with a rapid fill 20 ml per minute. You can see how quickly the pressure starts going up. And this is 10 ml per minute in the exact same patient. And these are data from David, uh, again, from 1992. Just remarkable difference with uh, a slow flow, slow fill. Um, how about bladder modulating medications? Many patients, of course, those with neurogenic bladders are on anticholinergic medications or uh, beta-3 agonists these days. And uh, it, it's very, very important to know when medications were last given. In fact, it's a variable that we record on our urodynamics uh, reports. And it's very, very important. And it allows you to compare as insofar as you can apples to apples. So the last time the child came three months ago, we made an, an, an adjustment to the medication. He or she took the med four hours before the study. This time you want to time that as closely as possible. If they come, they've come and they've taken it, you know, 24 hours or more, then you have to wonder how valid that is given the half the half life of these medications. So this is a CMG 24 hours after the last medication. You can see that this pressure is quite high. The abdominal pressure is low, meaning the detrusor pressure is in fact quite high. So the, the medication in this case, anticholinergic had worn off. The patient comes back and the medication was taken six hours uh, uh, within the CMG. And you can see the dramatic difference much larger capacity bladder, 365 versus 275, pressure is much lower. We go from being concerned to being not concerned clinically. Very, very important to, to track when patients are taking their meds. And how about status of the upper urinary tract? By that, I mean the presence or absence of vesicoureteral reflux. So here we have a study that we see 
Filling pressures look pretty good up until about 150 ml. Pressures are nice and low. Then there's a prolonged voiding phase. And let's just say this is normal for the most part. We're not too worried about these dynamics. But then when you get a VCUG, and if you have access to a video your dynamics, you would have seen this. You'll see that the patient has vesicular re reflux, high grade, let's say this is left side uh, grade five, and then right side grade, let's see, at least four. So this represents a, a, a ready pop-off mechanism um, through which pressure will pop off and your artificially will artificially lower your filling pressures. So you always have to look at this urodynamic study and know the status of your patient's vesicular reverse reflux, especially in those patients with neurogenic bladder, and take them with a grain of salt. You can't feel good about these pressures unnecessarily if you've got reflux that looks like this. So what is the true detrusor pressure? You know, these are things in pediatric urodynamics that continue to vex us, to be honest. Um, and I'll show you this in a cartoon. It'll be a little bit more clear. But here is this detrusor pressure. You can see the steep climb. The pressure goes up. Then we let the patient calm down for two minutes. Either they leak a little bit or they don't. We stop filling. And then we, we, we often see this pattern of this equilibrated pressure that then comes down and settles down. The question is, um, what is more valid? And I don't have an answer for you, actually, uh, but it's a phenomenon that we often see. We're trying to publish uh, on this, and um, we're in the, in the data gathering phase. But it's an interesting observation. So how about compliance, i.e. the change in pressure over the change in volume? Where do you measure this? Do you measure it here or here or down here? The answer is it depends, and it depends on what matters to you. Um, if a patient, say for example, on intermittent catheterization comes into your clinic and the patient is always catheterizing for 120 cc's or lower, and you know that because the patient's family has a nice diary, uh, then in this particular case, whatever pressure at 150 doesn't make a clinical difference. It doesn't matter, this is artificial. In that case, I'm gonna know, wanna know what my compliance is at 120 ml. So the bottom line is you wanna ask the compliance at volumes that are physiologically and clinically relevant to your particular patient. So um, getting back to this, what is the true detrusor pressure? This equilibrated pressure is this uh, measurement that we stop the pump and then take a measurement and see what happens. Um, we feel that that is probably uh, more accurate. We, we presented this at the New England AUA in 2017. We also get something that's, uh, that dates back to the 1990s, uh, and that's the, an opening pressure. Uh, and this I find very, very useful. Basically, we, we, and this all comes from Stu Bauer, of course, we place the catheter, we empty the bladder, and the patient, again, is instructed to come well hydrated. Um, we get an opening pressure. We record that volume. That is the opening pressure at the opening volume, physiologic. So you get a very good sense. Child has 100 cc's and their pressure is five centimeters of water. Then we fill and do our urodynamics. And then we say, when we fill the bladder to that same volume, 100 cc's, our systemetric pressure is X. And if it's 25 centimeters of water, well, then you have to question the validity of the, the, validity of the test because your opening pressure was five. However, if it's seven, four, then you're in the ballpark, you feel pretty good about your urodynamic studies. So we definitely use this every single time. And again, it's something we report on our urodynamic um, uh, reporting sheet. So uh, this is just that cartoon I promised. This is that maximum detrusor pressure, just looks like the urodynamics tracing that I showed you. And this is that equilibrated pressure. And generally we wait about two minutes to let the bladder kind of settle down. And our pattern is that the vast majority of times, this pressure will be lower. Um, and so anyway, something uh, to keep in mind, more of this coming, but certainly I think deserves a second look in terms of uh, what, is, what are the parameters that are clinically valid. And again, this is the opening pressure, and then we'll get that opening pressure and match it to the, to the pressure when we reach that opening volume. So um, how do we measure system metric bladder capacity? It would seem simple, right? You fill the bladder, you take the capacity. Well, it's not so simple, of course. Um, most studies take roughly 20 minutes of filling, give or take, say, five or 10 minutes. Um, so is it the instilled volume um, at, at the time of the first leak or when a, a patient experiences discomfort, whichever occurs first? Should it include urine produced during the testing? Uh, is it the residual bladder volume after the first leak plus the amount leaked? And should we do a second or even third fill 
um, if, if you're trying to be the most accurate possible in determining the true capacity. So um, realize it's very important that urine is being produced the entire time. Um, and so in this case, we filled with 280, but we emptied 420 ml. And so that's very important to record. So you can actually make the calculations that matter, the compliance, uh, so on and so forth, maximum nutrition, storage pressure, et cetera. Um, and so this is an example of the difference between a first and a second fill. And so you will see here, this is the first fill, small bladder capacity, pressure's okay, patient was uncomfortable, generated avoiding contraction. And we do it again, that was 50 ml, we filled the exact same time, this exact same way, five ml per minute. This time the patient settles down and she holds 180 ml, still beautiful pressures throughout, very normal and a nice, nice voiding phase. So um, you have to match the urodynamics of the clinical scenario. If you fill and you get a bladder capacity of 50 ml in a child who's seven years old, it doesn't make any sense, especially if the, if the child is obviously uncomfortable. So um, how do you measure detrusor overactivity in children? Again, kids that are moving around, um, they're, they're unhappy, often crying. That's why I originally said it takes a village. It really does um, to get kids through this study. So how do you define this? Um, a, an overactive contraction is defined as a rise in the detrusor pressure more than 15 centimeters of water during the filling phase. And, but is the timing important? Is it during the first or second or possibly third quartile of filling? Um, what's its significance that it occurs just before voiding or at estimated bladder capacity? And it's probably that the child is trying to suppress normal voiding contraction. The point here is that it's, it's important to be observant during the study, especially in pediatrics, which is why we generally have one of our physician interpreting the urodynamics be there to watch it. Uh, and that is because when you see a contraction on the, on, on the tracing, you have to have a sense of what was happening. So our nurses that conduct the studies put a lot of effort into uh, annotating the studies very accurately with what is happening at a certain uh, point of time. And in general, we are conservative about calling overactive contractions. Uh, a child has to be pretty calm and we have to be fairly convinced. Otherwise, we generally would say it's, um, it's artificial interference. So um, how about uh, combining a CMG with a patch EMG? Basically, um, this is perfect for a six-year-old girl, for example, with dysfunctional voiding, has daytime incontinence and recurrent non-febrile urinary tract infections. So no kidney infections, just bladder infections. A uh, urodynamics reveals normal, normal capacity, no overactive bladder, and quieting on the sphincter. Kind of, this is like the uroflowmetry with patch EMG. So we're, we're seeing that when she voids, this is just like the uroflow curve, she's quieting her sphincter. Perfect. But we're also seeing that during the filling, her bladder capacity is normal. She has a nice uh, non-overactive bladder that is nicely compliant. So how about um, sphincter needle EMGs? And this is something that we do in Boston. We probably do about 10 of these a week. I'm gonna show you a quick video about what this looks like. And listen, sounds like interference. And I'll tell you when the needle is, is hitting the sphincter muscle. Yeah. So when it got loud right there at the end, that is when the needle makes it into the sphincter muscle. Realize that whether you put this concentric needle, this concentric EMG needle into the sphincter muscle, into your, into your gastrocnemius, into your quadricep muscle, if the muscle is firing normally, you're going to get the exact same pattern. That same noise that you heard in that sphincter muscle is the same noise that you'll hear when you hit the muscle of interest in any muscle group that you're targeting to study its EMG. And what you're studying is basically the motor unit potentials. And these are the normal motor unit potentials that we see. Um, it's great. These are fibrillation potentials though. And these are something we don't, we never like to see because these are an early sign of denervation. So we have a child that comes in, for example, happens all the time. They have spina bifida and they have something that has changed. Scoliosis is worsening, new foot deformity, back pain, leg pain, maybe new incontinence, uh, unclear. Well, 
this allows you to study the motor unit potentials of that sphincter muscle very, very precisely. And it allows you to find patterns such as fibrillation potentials that can allow you to know if that muscle is being denervated. And I tell patients all the time, it's like if I herniate a disc in my back and I'm having terrible leg pain and maybe some weakness. Uh, if my neurosurgeon is worried enough and is trying to decide if he or she is going to operate on my back, they may send me to a neurologist to get an EMG of my, uh, of my muscle group that that level in my back uh, is associated with. And if that muscle shows denervation by fibrillations, that neurosurgeon will likely operate on my back. Conversely, it does not show fibrillation potentials. That neurosurgeon can say, you know, you're in a lot of pain, and but you're not having, uh, you know, muscle damage. You're not denervating your muscle, so let's sit tight. And that's how our neurosurgeons kind of approach our patients that have tethered cord, for example. If this doesn't show denervation and the bladder dynamics are okay, we can say, you know, that scoliosis is probably not related to spinal cord tethering. So this is something that we use uh, a lot of. Um, and getting back to it takes a village. This is a neurologist that sits with us and does these studies. Um, Stu Bauer is also um, uh, facile with this. Our newest faculty member, Scott Wang, is actually training for this with adult neurologists at the Beth Israel Hospital, so he can become uh, competent to do this as well. But we think this is really, really, really important. And so when we're getting, when we put this needle in the sphincter muscle, we also test the various uh, sacral reflexes, uh, which gives us a whole host of information, mostly to compare to old studies, to again, tell our neurosurgeons uh, and our families, is there any significant change? And what you want to see is just what you see on patch EMG, patients voiding. So the sphincter muscles firing down here to the right and the, the patient voids, you want to see that sphincter activity totally silenced. If it does not, then they are dyssynergic. And so when do you choose patch versus needle EMG if you have access to needle EMG? Patch is when you have an obvious non-neurogenic phenotype, such as a patient with dysfunctional voiding, recurrent non-febrile urinary tract infections, and you're wondering the response of the sphincter to detrusor overactivity. You, we use needle EMG for patients with known or suspected neurologic lesions, repeat studies after spinal cord uh, surgery, and if it's important to know the precise sacral spinal cord uh, function. And again, these are mostly in partnership with our neurosurgery uh, colleagues. Video your dynamics, I have one slide on it. And I have one slide on it because we don't do it at Boston Children's, believe it or not. Um, we will be doing it. It's, this is sort of a legacy uh, thing. Uh, but the bottom line is video your dynamics really are state of the art and really are the standard of care. And this combines, of course, all the parameters that we've been talking about with a fluoroscopic image. It allows you to visualize, for example, um, the trusor sphincter dysynergy or maybe dysfunctional voiding. Uh, be the spinning top urethra, for example. You can localize the level of a urethral obstruction. You can see reflux happening real time during uh, the filling phase. To again, get back to, are my pressures valid? Um, and instead of this, what we have combined our urodynamic studies with is a radionuclide cystogram. And that goes back to when fluoroscopy imparted a much higher level of ionizing radiation. So we felt very good about doing radionuclide cystograms which you know, were a fraction of, of the radiation, associated with a fraction of the radiation. But now with pulse uh, digital fluoroscopy, that, that, uh, that delta is really negligible. So um, it, when we have our new facility in the next couple of years, uh, we will have uh, a state-of-the-art video dynamics uh, capability. And this is really what people should have and should be doing. So the goals for your dynamic studies in children really begin by posing and asking the right questions uh, that, that your dynamics will help you answer. It characterizes the lower urinary tract function in an efficient, reliable, and reproducible manner. It enhances the understanding of lower tract function in various disease states. It differentiates between possible treatment alternatives. It promotes effective therapy, and then you can explain outcomes with validated measures. And so uh, just to go uh, a little bit on a tangent, I have uh, you know, my main clinical interest is spina bifida, uh, and we have a large spina bifida center here at Boston Children's. We treat about 850 or so uh, children, so it's a very robust, very busy service. And we've been trying to really standardize our urodynamics, coincident with the um, 
the CDC, uh, NSBPR, National Spina Bifida Patient Registry. Uh, and there are a lot of recommendations around standardization of this, of this study. For years and years, we've been doing urodynamics in the newborn period, uh, usually within the first one to three months of life to get a baseline. And these are the so-called full study, at least that's our internal nomenclature, which includes that needle sphincter EMG. We generally get those studies about every six months for the first two years of life, and then about yearly until four or five years of age. And then from there on an individualized basis. Um, we also get these at the time of diagnosis of occult lesion. So an older child uh, that comes in and was found to have uh, spina bifida occulta with a lipoma and a tethered cord, for example. Patient with spina bifida that all of a sudden gets hydronephrosis and high grade reflux. Uh, patients that come with incontinence after, ha after having been dry. Um, again, patients with changes in lower extremities or any suspicion whatsoever of retethering. We do a urodynamic study to interrogate the lower urinary tract, including that all important uh, uh, sphincter. So um, it again provides a baseline assessment for lower tract function, including the sphincter innervation. Um, this again identifies children at risk, so bladder dynamics and whether their sphincter is synergic or dyssynergic. It promotes specific medical and or surgical therapy and assesses their effectiveness. So we change the medication, we'll repeat your dynamics and ask, is it working? Um, and allows subsequent studies to denote progressive changes in function or innervation. And finally, enhances parental counseling, of course, regarding future lower tract function and sexual function. So um, how about prophylactic versus expectant treatment from the perspective of your dynamics? Many of these are very old data and still questions that are asked uh, on board exams, for example, certainly on rounds. Um, what is the detrusor leak point pressure that's associated with the risk of upper tract deterioration? Well, Dr. McGuire in 1981 taught us that it's 40 centimeters of water. You know, that is something that has become absolute, you know, law in urology. And there are more up-to-date studies suggesting that perhaps even as low as 20 centimeters of water can be detrimental. And it really boils down to probably compliance of the bladder. So if your pressure is 20 at 10 mLs, well, that's a very stiff bladder. Uh, whereas if it's 40 centimeters of water at 400 cc's and you catheterize usually for 300, maybe it's not, it's not, so, um, uh, not, not so important. So really this depends, but 40 centimeters of water is that, is that number that's been associated with upper tract risk. Um, Stu Bauer back in the 80s, early 80s, showed that patients that had this dysynergy, so uh, the truser sphincter dysynergy, had at least a 50% chance of developing upper tract deterioration very quickly within the first three to five years of life. So very, very important uh, to identify it early, which is why, again, we do it uh, within the first few months of life and then with some frequency in the first couple years of life. Um, augmentation cystoplasty is significantly reduced when children are started on prophylactic lower urinary tract a treatment such as intermittent catheterization and anticholinergic uh, therapy. So um, there's a meta-analysis uh, of, of your dynamics in, in kids that have spina bifida. This is 22 studies, more than 2,000 patients. These are the prevalence of the urodynamic parameters that we're talking about. So overactive bladder, two-thirds, sphincter denervation in two-thirds, and dysynergy in a full third of patients. And basically, um, if patient, about 55 to 80% of of patients have deterioration to dysynergy and their leak point pressures rise to 40 centimeters of water in 68% uh, of patients. And so uh, this is a huge uh, patient base with a lot of uh, different uh, uh, characteristics and variables. But really what this highlights is the importance of close monitoring. These kids are at risk for deterioration. Even if these numbers are lower or higher, doesn't matter, they're definitely at risk. And so your dynamics are valid in kids that have a neurogenic bladder from spina bifida, and it's used to monitor real time uh, that risk of, of deterioration. Highlighting the importance is this study in 2017 by our colleague in, uh, Christian Sager in, in Buenos Aires, who spent about a year with us in our your dynamic facility. And he looked at um, 60 kids undergoing your dynamics and DMSA scan and found that uh, your dynamic findings reflective of a hostile bladder dynamic um, are associated independently with uh, DMSA scarring and, and all other parameters were non-significant. So the importance of bladder dynamics 
and hostile bladder dynamics in particular to the risk of upper tract deterioration is, is real. And so how about newborns with spina bifida, those one to three month olds that we do our urodynamics uh, in, and basically 12% will have normal urodynamics to start, but a third demonstrate these deleterious changes uh, before three, again, informing why we do them repeatedly within the first few years of life. But a full 25% will regain normal function after they're untethered. So these are patients that maybe started with synergy. They retethered, they had some symptoms. We got the urodynamic study with a needle EMG, found this synergy, 25% will revert to normal syner uh, synergy. Still leave 75% that won't, but at least this is a number we can tell our patients to have some hope of recovery. And this is very important. This is uh, a study of a very limited study, but recent, 2017, with 15 patients with lumbar spina bifida. All had normal lower extremity function. So these are patients that, that ambulate, that walk into your office. Um, and you can see that a fair number of these have small bladder capacities, diminished compliance, high detrusor leak point pressure, greater than 40 centimeters of water, and, and bladder overactivity. So the key here is that you cannot predict bladder function uh, by a patient having normal lower extremity functions. Totally separate. If they walk in your office, you still should look at them as if they were wheelchair dependent and, and as if they have neurogenic bladder. It's how, that's the way we do it. So how about um, your dynamic studies in patients with prenatal closure, which is becoming very popular. We have studied this and others, and basically there is no difference. And so patients that were closed prenatally have the exact same urodynamic and urologic outcomes as patients that were closed uh, postnatally. And this was, uh, this was reported on a larger scale by the authors of the participa participating centers of the MOMS trial. And basically there was no change uh, in, um, post, uh, in urodynamics between prenatal and postnatally closed um, spina bifida lesions. And so um, it's important to treat patients closed prenatally identically uh, to patients that are closed uh, postnatally. How about reliability of urodynamic interpretation? Well, uh, disappointingly, I will say, um, there are a couple recent studies on this, and this is probably the most recent and the best one. This is a study that, that involved 14 pediatric urologists these are urodynamic experts at seven of the National Spina Bifida Patient Registry CDC sites. Uh, we're one of those now, we weren't during uh, this time. Um, there was substantial agreement when looking at urodynamic interpretation when assessing fluoroscopic bladder shape. So just literally, what's the shape of the bladder? That's pretty easy when you think about it. There's only moderate agreement for bladder safety, i.e. hostile versus non-hostile and filling detrusor pressure and bladder capacity even. Again, getting to how you define bladder capacity. It's only moderate agreement. There was fair agreement for very important stuff, synergy versus dissynergy and the presence of overactivity. So we are talking about defining hostile bladder dynamics, talking about this as if it were something that is easy to do. Um, these are the top centers around the country uh, and you can see how difficult it is to get inter, um, inter-observer uh, reliability of your dynamics. So a lot of work to do to get us on the same page. So what's the impact on pediatric urology? Your dynamics is a basis for understanding the pathophysiology of most lower tract condition. It affords us an opportunity to predict future responses of the lower urinary tract. It helps improve or maintain normal upper urinary tract function in those that have dysfunctions that put them at risk. It allows a roadmap, a roadmap to effectively and efficiently manage the lower tract, but of course, we need to explore new methods uh, to ease invasiveness. Uh, certainly, gosh, non-invasive urodynamics, boy, one of the holy grails, certainly for us, um, or somehow to better get patients through it, like virtual reality or other different things that we can help our poor little patients um, cope with these studies and unify or make interpretation more reliable. One of our newest faculty members, a wonderful urologist named Scott Wong, uh, is, uh, did an MBAN at Sloan, MIT Sloan uh, in advanced analytics. And so we are trying to apply uh, machine learning algorithms to your dynamic tracings to get uh, basically um, you know, automatic uh, interpretation. And so, so far we've been successful in picking up detrusor overactivity insofar as we define it, of course. Uh, but nonetheless, there is hope, I think for future, um, you can imagine just like ECGs, or EKGs are interpreted automatically, a quick read, 
we're hoping to do the same um, for, for your dynamics. So the key takeaways uh, for this evening uh, is to ask the question you hope to answer from the your dynamics study. Uh, pick the study that really you need to get. Um, educate the family and familiarize them with what you hope to learn and why you're doing what you're doing. You're gonna be asking them to go through a lot. Know the radiologic status of the urinary tract. Try to eliminate artifacts that give you a valid test so you can minimize misleading data. Record all medicines, doses, and the times taken. Um, and if you need to know an effect of a medication, tell them to take it two hours before. That'll put you between two and four hours. So make sure that they take their med and record it. Have patients repeat testing if necessary to have a relaxed child. Again, easier said than done when the child is screaming bloody murder throughout the test. But, um, but do your very best you can uh, to, to get them through it. And then understand the parameters you are measuring and define them specifically when interpreting findings. Uh, and be consistent when you interpret these. And, um, and hopefully we'll have consistency across our specialty as we continue to develop ways uh, that we can interpret these in the same way. Um, thank you very much for your attention. It was really a pleasure uh, to be here tonight and to talk about your dynamics. And I will leave um, this uh, survey. Uh, you can just scan this uh, QR code and, um, and leave your survey results. And I guess we'll end it there, Michelle, and I'll start looking through the questions to see if there are any. I think Michelle is going to open up the questions to um, attendees. If you're interested in just asking verbally, please be my guest. Go ahead. Um, I think it's easier than typing out questions. So please, if there are any questions, um, go on. Perhaps someone could ask um, how long a pediatric urodynamics test takes. Um, it, uh, our tests range from, you know, anywhere from 30 minutes to 60 minutes. And most often the biggest limitation is waiting for the patient to void. That really is um, possibly the, the, the hardest uh, thing to wait for. And in fact, sometimes we have to pour a little warm water on their feet and run, you know, run water as sort of uh, some voodoo uh, type uh, maneuvers to encourage them to have a bladder contraction. So it takes a lot of patience, but often 30 to 60 minutes is the ballpark uh, for an invasive urodynamic study. So I have a question in the chat. It says, um, what do you think is the most ideal minimal age for patient to have your dynamic studies? Um, what is your youngest age patient? Uh, it's a great question. And you know, our youngest age patient is about a month old, one to two to three months. And those are all the patients that are born with uh, spina bifida uh, and have their lesion closed. Generally, the patient has their spina bifida uh, back closed, uh, they go home, and they come back within the first few months to have their initial urodynamics and generally a VCUG. They typically get an ultrasound before they leave the hospital. So we are able to do um, urodynamics in very, very young children very successfully. And truth be told, uh, when you have a baby and you're, you're, and you're doing urodynamics, the, the bladder dynamics part uh, is tricky. Uh, if the child is screaming throughout the entire study, despite feeding and everything else, it's hard to get valid dynamics. But what you will get is a valid needle sphincter EMG. And at that point in time, it's that's probably the more important parameter. So we feel good about that. Um, the next question is also excellent. Do we do sedation in very active patients? The answer is no. We we worry a lot about sedation impacting bladder dynamics, specifically a patient's ability to do, um, uh, to avoid to completion, avoid successfully. So we generally try not to give sedation. 
only once a year or so do we give some patients a little bit of an Ativan, for example, a benzodiazepine, just to take the edge off. And generally speaking, those are patients with behavioral issues, uh, profound developmental issues, say severe autism, for example, that it's critical that we get the study for whatever reason, uh, but the only way to get them through it really is to give them a little sedation. But that's the extent of it. Um, this is owed, I will say, uh, full disclosure, this is owed entirely to our wonderful nursing staff and our child life specialist who really combine um, you know, their forces to get uh, patients through this. And um, I saw that my colleague, Dr. Finkelstein, just wrote in a, um, a message and she is actually um, the one who conducted the entire virtual reality study. And um, so it, it's things like that that get patients through it and, and not sedation. So we're very hopeful for virtual reality or again, something else, but something to help patients get through. Um, Dr. Finkelstein asked, um, how often do you do more than one fill for your dynamics? Um, we, I would say about 50% of the time we will do two fills. Um, and, and that if, in an ideal world, we would do two fills every single time. But um, for some patients, as we all know well, you're, you're, you're sometimes lucky to get that one done. Uh, and so, um, and uh, so about 50% of the time, I would say, is, is, a, is, a, is a reasonable estimate. Um, I have another question. Um, can you do your dynamics through a suprapubic tube? Absolutely, yes. Um, several times per year, we will take a patient to the operating room and put a suprapubic urodynamic catheter in, and then a patient come, uh, recovers and then goes right to your dynamics for their study. So absolutely, yes and very useful in patients that either cannot tolerate transurethral catheterization or in whom you cannot for whatever reason anatomically. So yes, we definitely do your dynamics through a suprapubic tube. Uh, so is the, is the uh, formula to calculate estimated bladder capacity the same? for normal children. Yes, in general, the, and the, that formula that I showed you, the age plus two times 30, is generally in kids older than two years old. For those younger than two, we generally do age times uh, seven, and that will give you, in kilograms, and that will give you your, um, uh, your um, estimated bladder capacity. Not nearly as accurate, um, so the, the after two years old is the one that we generally like to use. But estimated bladder capacity in children with neurogenic bladder, um, you know, you would hope that their bladder capacities are the same as non-neurogenic bladders, but of course we know that that's not the case. Looks like we just have a few minutes left. Any other questions? These are terrific. Um, a question just came through. What do you think of the reliability of your dynamics in oliguric and uric CKD patients with no underlying cacout? Yes, this is a great question. Um, do, you root, do you perform routine your dynamics in transplant patients? And do I think this is necessary? Um, interesting uh, question. In fact, I was just discussing this with our transplant team literally end of last week for, uh, for different reasons. But uh, we do your we do do your dynamics in the vast majority of children um, before transplant, except, however, for the patient that has is making urine, uh, even though they're in renal failure and have FSGS, for example, as, as the cause of their renal failure. Patients with no history whatsoever of lower tract dysfunction. We don't put those kids through your dynamics because they have declared themselves normal just by a long history of being normal. But any child that has been enuric, and certainly, of course, any child with a urologic anatomic reason for the renal failure, valves, obviously neurogenic bladder, so on and so forth, all get your dynamic studies. As far as the child with a defunctionalized bladder from being enuric, we have not yet um, done any kind of preoperative bladder conditioning. But this, this is the subject that we were discussing at the end of last week. Is this something that we want to do? And this is difficult. We've not studied it, and I'm not aware of the data, uh, to be honest. And I don't know in pediatrics um, uh, what 
the um, recommended approach to these patients is. Um, bladder cycling in kids, of course, is difficult. Catheterization and filling the bladder, so on and so forth, is not trivial either. Um, but from the urodynamic perspective, to answer the question, yes, we do do urodynamics in any patient uh, in whom we suspect any lower tract dysfunction before we go connecting a graft uh, to that reservoir. And Michelle, I think that is, we're at 9.01, top of the hour. So I think that probably concludes our uh, session. I wanna thank everybody again uh, for joining. Uh, I really enjoyed this. And if there are other questions, uh, please uh, email me. Uh, my email is on one of the slides, um, carlos.estrada at children's.harvard.edu. Please don't hesitate. Thanks again.